Night for the Museum speaking event. And I know the rain has kind of got some folks sitting at the house wishing they were here. Uh, I was telling John, and, and he also had some texts. I had quite a few texts today asking me if it was going to rain. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It wasn't raining then. Uh, but anyway, lots of folks don't like to get out when it's raining. So I know John will uh, put on a great evening for us tonight, as he always does. And we, he's also going to sign some books there uh, at the end if you haven't picked up any of his latest books. Um, like I said, this is our 67th night for the museum. Uh, we've been open now a little over 11 years, which is hard to believe that we are still here 11 years later, but we are. If I could, please get my board members to raise their hands. I know there's some here tonight, some uh, past and present board members. Look at all of them. They're all sitting in one <laughs> cluster over there. Um, our, um, our board members are, are, are very valuable assets to the museum. Uh, we just had our big gala uh, in September. I know some of you were able to come, some of you not. Uh, it was a very successful event. Uh, we're close to about half of what we need to start on the new building next door. So tonight, if you weren't able to come, if you pick up one of these envelopes in this little basket, you can still mail that check in before, <laughs> so you can get all that tax credit that you need for this year. Uh, but pick up one of those envelopes if you weren't able to uh, come to the gala. Every little bit helps. Um, let's see. I guess that's it. I didn't have much written down. Uh, of course, John doesn't need an introduction. He he is. He is my go-to person and has been for, what, the last 25 years on stuff? Um, <laughs> it seems I'll, like it. I'll, 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 I'll <laughs> yeah, okay. We were both, we both started very young at all this. Uh, but, you know, he, his, uh, he's, he's just got so much information. And what he's allowed me to do <laughs> the last few years is just <clears throat> such an asset to the to the museum and to the community, and that's to put his stories and all of his information in book form. And that's what a lot of these books are that you see over here. Um, all the stories that are in the Men and Press Herald for the last few years, uh, those are in different volumes there. Um, the Menden Cemetery books, we ended up doing two of those, and he's going to talk a little bit about some of the people that are buried there uh, tonight. And so there's, there's just lots of different information, and some of it we would decide, he would start talking about sports stuff, and we decided, well, we'll just do that all in a sports book. We're still, we need more sports stories. Because <laughs> that one's kind of halfway finished. Uh, but anyway, we're going to let John do the rest of the talking, and remember, be sure to turn those phones off, Bill's videoing it, and you'll be able to purchase the videos later if you'd like. Okay, glad to see you all here in the rain. Uh, open with my standard line for the last five or six years. Sorry I'm going to be sitting down. Uh, you'd prefer me sitting down when you wouldn't somebody come to come pick me up. So, you know, we'll, we'll leave it at that. The other introductory apology is uh, I hadn't been teaching face-to-face -face classes for about three years. I was playing on the internet. So my voice projection may not be good. I came here. I'm trying my best to, to get projection on it. But anyway, I don't have... Shelley's voice carrying ability. But uh, anyway, um, we'll say one thing. I did get amused. She was talking about these last books. I told somebody earlier tonight, I'll get a, a message on Facebook and I found out I've written a new book. <laughs> and she does all the putting together and all the work on it. So anyway, you know, that's, uh, I really appreciate her doing that because I do want to see it preserved. I'm not just doing it to get my name in the paper. I think it's important to keep it preserved. So anyway. Glad to hear that. Uh, earlier this year, when Shelly asked me what I taught, because, you know, I haven't been able to do it a lot lately, that uh, maybe it was time to talk something about the cemetery again. And, yep, it's very much something that needs to be talked about. 
don't want to offend the mayor, I've got the mayor out here, so you got to be careful about this for a minute, but uh, <laughs> it was the city of Menden Cemetery until the 1920s. And in the 1920s, the city of Menden said, mm, we don't want to do this anymore. And so, of course, you weren't around, so it's okay. Uh, <laughs> Thank goodness. Yeah, uh, we'd be a little old for you to hold it now, anyway. Uh, although, one of the mayors at that time, I'm going to talk back, I think it's the one that passed it off, so we'll talk about it just a little bit tonight. But anyway, uh, it was always a problem. I've got newspaper articles from the 1880s, and one again about 1900, they had to have a town wide fundraising to keep up the cemetery. And uh, in the 1920s, they formed the Minute Cemetery Association. They took over <coughs> keeping the cemetery. And they, everybody had all their folks buried in the cemetery. They were still living here. And they got a lot of money. Unbelievable, they got so much money, they decided at some point, I think it was in the early 50s, we don't need to get any more money. We've got enough forever. We've got invested, and the interest will just cover us. Well, by about the 1980s, when I got asked to be on the cemetery board, that was a long dead idea. And the other thing, forgive me, long dead, is the folks that had people directly buried in the cemetery. So it got to be a bit of a problem. And uh, got a lot of carpet baggers come in. Shelley's got nobody buried out there. I've got a great aunt and great uncle that I never knew buried out there. Uh, Ty Pendergrass, that's headed the board forever, has in-laws buried out there, in-laws family. So, you know, it's been kind of tough. So we had the ghost walk for several years. Everybody loved it. Shelley was going to have to be institutionalized if we made her keep doing that, as much work as that involved. So we kind of stepped aside from that. So it seemed like a good time to bring up the men's cemetery again. Now, I get lazy sometimes. I had a program I've got to do next month. And for it, a real good idea was, do we have any Revolutionary War veterans buried in the Menon Cemetery? Nope. Scratch that idea. So, uh, had to figure out something to talk about. I don't know if y'all noticed, I know your mailboxes did, we had an election this last week. <laughs> so, you know, politics is always a, a good thing to talk about. So I picked out three folks. Oh, I had a, I had a long list the first time. I had seven or eight. And y'all gonna get so tired by the time I get through these three, I knew that was never gonna work. So I picked out three folks buried in the Menden Cemetery, largely lived their lives in the 19th century, that have political connections or in one of the cases were political themselves. And I'll talk a little bit about that and uh, some interesting stories. I think they're interesting. Y'all got stuck in here now, so you know, <laughs> couldn't get out, so we're kind of stuck. But so, again, I see my title, and I looked at it and I said, oh my gosh, what a title is that? I apologize. Couldn't find a better way to phrase it. You know, it looks like, looks like the title thing that you put on master's thesis. My master's thesis title is four lines long, you know, you know not, not exactly good for a short title. But both the barriers in the, from the 19th century in the Menden Cemetery. <coughs> and... Yeah, it worked. Okay, I'm never sure about this. So, I was in the hospital for quite a while, several years ago. I, all my technological skills went out there. The so anyway, but it's working a good deal. Thomas Kennan. Obviously, that name's going to ring a bell. Born in 1792 in Chatham County, North Carolina. Died here in 1849. And uh, not only does he have political ancestors, he has political roots. Father, William Kennan, signed a document that I was taught about many years as a history student. I taught for many years as a history student, and darn it, didn't find out until today that I already, my program was already ready, that about three quarters of historians think it was fake. The Mecklenburg Declaration of Independence. Uh, the way we always taught it, and I'm gonna continue to pretend like that, is it was a year before that real Declaration of Independence, and the folks in Mecklenburg County, North Carolina, said, we want to be independent. So his dad was involved in that, was a legislator, was a soldier. Died when Thomas was fairly young. And he and his mother moved to Georgia. In Georgia, he married uh, Lucy Broadnax Brooklyn, or about four other variations you'll find in family trees somewhere, but something approximating that name. 
and she was also, uh, she was a native of Georgia. Stayed in Georgia till the 1830s. About 1838, they came west after the Indian Removal Act when everybody started coming west. And settled in Claiborne Parish near Athens. Not good at Claiborne Parish history, I assume it's what we call old Athens based on the time frame, but uh, anyway. Settled there, after a very few years, relocated to Dublin. And living in Dublin, about, it appears about five years, six years, as they got older, they moved into Mendham. Now, this Dublin story has always fascinated me because Lucy and Thomas moved into Mendham, but they had, as we're going to see in a minute, quite a few kids. The kids stayed on that property. And I was talking to somebody earlier tonight about when you start doing Louisiana genealogy, and you get those parishes that moved around. Well, I've always loved this because they moved in that house on that land in 1839, 1840, and they were living in Clayton Parish in 1848. But they didn't go nowhere but they were living in Bienville Parish. In 1871, they still didn't go anywhere. They were living in Webster Parish. So, you know, that's when you see people doing family trees, they're running that all the time. You know, but what parish was it then and what was going on? So anyway, they uh, moved into Mendon and uh, they died. That happened to all of us eventually. So anyway, uh, they did have eight children. The one I'm going to indirectly talk about really quickly was Edward John Kennan. Uh, born, obviously, in Georgia. Came here with the family. But anyway, Edward John Kennan had a son. Some of y'all probably remember, he's not been dead that long. Some of y'all are going to say, when I just said that, uh, you can't, you got to be kidding, but he died in 1966. Yeah, that was a long time ago. I remember 1966 pretty good. I don't remember the man, but anyway. Floyd Kennan. Now, Floyd Kennan was born in Dudley in 1891, is it? Yeah. He married, uh, Anna Laura Bach. Some of y'all folks may be familiar with Germantown. You know that name Bach. John Bach was the businessman of the Germantown colony. Uh, Anna Laura was one of the last valedictorians of the Minton Female College, 1889. School closed about 94. So toward the end of the time frame, he married her and uh, Floyd had a grocery store. First in Sibley. He still lived in Dublin, but he's Grocery store was in Sibley. And then about 1902, he moved to Main Street in Mendham. Not long, if I recall correctly, after he had a baby boy that we're about to talk about quite a bit. But anyway, he moved to Mendham, operated that grocery store until he was 81 years old. And in 1952, he retired. His brother took over the grocery store. I'll talk a little bit about his brother's son down the line here in a minute or two. But uh, in 1953, through somehow, I guess he must have had some political connections, uh, he got appointed into a vacant seat from Matt Lowe's seat on the Webster Parish Police Jury at 82. Wish I could read. Anyway, he uh, served out that term, ran for re-election in 1956. Got beat pretty badly, I hate to say that. I guess they may have thought he was too old, he was 85. But anyway, he uh, lived 10 more years after that. As I said, died in 1966. And, uh, oh, I didn't type that number on there, so I can't keep the numbers in my brain. I apologize. Now, as I mentioned, uh, he had a son in 1902. Born when they were still in Dublin. Uh, when he was about five or six months old, not quite that old, about two or three months old, family moved to Mendham. And bringing to Mendham, uh, technically, this is something you do, Mayor, the one fellow we probably need to have a statue to somewhere, uh, Robert Floyd Kennan. Uh, Robert Floyd Kennan, this is where the slideshow is going to get long, because it takes a long time to talk about what Bob Kennan did. Kenan uh, graduated from Minden High School in 1919. Went on to LSU, and somebody must have seen his 
little place in the, the uh, yearbook when they made up the idea of big man on campus. Uh, Bob Kennan was head of the Corps of Cadets. He was the starting center on the LSU football team. He was on the debate team. He wrote for the Reveille. He, uh, in case y'all are LSU fans, you need to leave. If you're not LSU, the Reveille is a school paper. So I said, I'm get confusing. I'll oh, be Texas A&M school paper. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I know why I shouldn't. Shouldn't have traced that rabbit. <laughs> I forgot to give you all that warning that I told all my classes. I get distracted by shiny objects and rabbits, so I apologize when I wander off like that. Don't, don't mean to. But uh, he also started the tennis team and was the first guy on the level on the tennis team. So pretty much overachiever. Finished LSU in 1923, went directly to LSU Law School, across the street over there in that old building they don't use anymore for much of anything. But uh, Finished LSU Law School in 1925, passed the bar, came home to Menda. Next year, 1926, at age 23, was elected the youngest mayor in the United States. So he overachieved, you know, he, he's 23 years old, mayor of Menda. Uh, and he did, you know, a little bit of advance that, so y'all can have something boring to look at. I didn't have a handout so he can color, but that would have been better. Um, his term as mayor, he had two-year terms. Just started having two-year terms a little bit before that. During his term, uh, we built the new City Hall fire station that sits where the vacant lot is down here now. We officially became a city. We wrote our new city charter. Uh, the railroad shops had just come to Mendham three years earlier. That money was pouring in building all over town. You can date a lot of these buildings around town from that time frame. So it really was a boom time. Did a pretty good job as mayor. Uh, oh, should I talk about this? I'm, I'm picking on the mayor and I really apologize, but I keep thinking <laughs> about it. The first, the first big battle over do we keep our power plant came while Kennan was mayor. And they did. And that's a whole other rabbit I could change. But not going to do it, but anyway, it was really a time of, of growth. Not exactly sure why, I think I know. When his term expired in 1928, he didn't run for re-election. 25, I guess it was time to retire, you know, anyway, so, but he did, two years later, come back, run for DA in what was then the second judicial district, now it's the 26th, Bozier Webster, had that job for 10 years, Interesting times he was had as lawyer there, as judge, in DA, whatever that job is, anyway. Uh, during that time frame, we had a city councilman assassinated by the mayor's son. Interesting case to have to handle. Got really sticky. Uh, the back of Menden failed, and the grand jury tried to indict probably everybody that was well-known and famous in Menden because the bank failed. He had to try to handle that. Oh, there were some interesting, other much more interesting cases. But anyway, he served 10 years in that job. Uh, I don't know why he stick around that long for that one, but anyway, because he was definitely climbing the ladder. 1940, we had a nice little political race. The justice from the Second Circuit Court of Appeals from here was one Harmon Drew. And Bob Kidder challenged Harmon Drew. And they had a pretty nasty, can you believe nasty politics? They had a pretty nasty and a close, relatively close race. But uh, Kenan won. Now, some of y'all may be familiar, some of y'all that are old as I am, that we had some weird laws in Louisiana. You'd get elected to a job and you didn't take it over like 15 months later. Well, that's what happened here. Got elected in 1940, fall of 1940. Wasn't supposed to take the seat until 1942. Well, oh, there's a picture back there. Something happened on December 7th, 1941. And what I've left out of his resume so far is he organized the first Minden National Guard unit, and he was the commander of it forever and ever. Well, you know, December 7th, he's on active duty. So, in another weird little twist, Harmon Drew kept the job for the next three years. 
Bob Bobkinen went to Europe, was a colonel in the U.S. Army, uh, worked in the Adjutant General's Corps. If I recall correctly, he had a brief brush working with a little bit of the setup of the Nuremberg Trials. But anyway, came home in 1945, took his seat on the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, and uh, within about six weeks of sitting on that court, one of our Supreme Court justices in Louisiana kicked the bucket. So he got bumped up to a temporary appointment on the Louisiana State Supreme Court, kept that job for two years, temporary job, to 1947. 1947, he bounced back down. He got a 10-year term on the Court of Appeals in those days. So he had three more years on his Court of Appeals term to serve. But 1947, we're hitching up on a Governor's race. Oh boy. Not just any governor's race. Earl Long was going to resurrect himself from the dead and run for governor. Sam Jones had set out the term he had to sit out. He was going to run for governor. Jimmy Olton, the congressman for Hammond, was going to run for governor. I think it's the second time Cousin Doobie J. Walk, the Catholic old man, was going to run for governor. And Bob Kennedy decided to run for governor. Wasn't going to jump Sam and Earl. And the primary, Sam ran first, Earl ran second. Uh, in the runoff, obviously Earl won. Bob Kennan did come in third, so pretty strong race. Because Bob Kennan's 45, see Earl's about early 50s by this time, Sam Jones around the same age. So, you know, he was clearly the up and coming. Next year, 1948, that dying thing hit again. John Overton, senator from Louisiana, kicked the bucket, left a vacant seat. The Long family settled on Russell <coughs> Long, who was only 29, which you have to be 30 to be a senator, but you know, it's the Long, who cares? Anyway, so he would be able to turn 30 before he took his seat. So anyway, we will almost taste a bad rabbit right then. I'll save it for another program sometime, but anyway. Um, in the Senate race, pretty much was a head up race. Bob Kennan and Earl Long. Earl Long. Russell Long. Sorry, wrong generation. Uh, the race was really tight. Again, I've already shocked you by talking about dirty politics, which you're in Louisiana you didn't know about. <laughs> We've had some problems with vote counting in Louisiana. Now, I do have to throw in one quick family story. At this time this election took place, my uncle was congressional secretary to Leonard Allen, uh, O.K. Allen's brother, the long machine congressman. He was about to go to work for Oprah Brooks, but he was still working for Leonard Allen. Uh, one of Uncle Bud's jobs was, I think he was a supervisor at this time, but the, the gist of his job was, you came and stood a certain distance from the polls with a marked paper ballot. Marked for the right candidates. As the people came up to vote, you stopped them and said, here we go. Here's this ballot. <coughs> you take it in there. You put this one in the box. That black ballot they give you, stick it in your pocket, come back out, and you'll get your dollar for the vote. So, you know, I know there was some strange things going on. Bob Kinnon lost. Narrowly to Russell lost. Now again, I did have the one advantage, and I did, my uncle told me this story. I ran it by Morgan Peoples, my beloved history teacher at Louisiana Tech. He said, yeah, I've heard the same story, but I couldn't prove it. Story is that Earl Long called Bob Kennan in as he was debating whether to challenge the election. He said, here's the deal, Bob. You dropped the challenge. I can't run for governor again in 52. And I'll pick somebody to run in that race that you'll beat the pants off of. Uh, Earl said more colorfully, but anyway. Uh, you know, just what you need to do. My uncle swore that's what happened. That he wasn't in the room, but he was in the ante room when it took place. Anyway, uh, whatever took place, Bob essentially started running for governor. The minute that was done, and hit the button. 1952, and boy, talk about a dirty race. I can chase a lot of rabbits there too, but anyway, 
1952 Governor's Race, Bob Kennan ran, Big Bad Bill Dodd ran, uh, Hale Bob ran, Mary Ellen Parker, a woman ran, my goodness, anyway. Uh, but the law candidate was Judge Carla Spate of Baton Rouge. Now, his son's a really good math teacher at LSU Shreveport. I wonder how many of y'all that aren't really follow politics ever heard of Judge Carla Spate before. Yeah. It looks it looks kind of <coughs> like Earl paid off his, his demons. Don't know. Anyway, Bob Kennan won really handily in the runoff and got to be governor. Now, the late Doris Carter, who I, I miss, I didn't really talk to her that much, but she was a great, great researcher, wrote, and y'all probably don't know, she was from Minden, lived across from Webster High School, and she was a professor at Granville. She turned her doctoral dissertation into a book called Robert Floyd Kennan, Civics Book Governor. That's what he was known as. Trying to reform all the stuff Earl had put in in 1948, reform Louisiana government. He did make a lot of changes. Gave a lot of many people jobs. Uh, Mr. Greer got to be the commissioner of administration. Uh, his old law partner, Greg Kitchens, got to be head of the tax bureau. Uh, his brother-in-law, Dr. Sintel, got to be head of charity hospital. So we got some plums for occasion anyway. But he did have a well, good government term. Nobody questions that. What he did is, you know, only problem is we still have, you can't run for re-election after your term. So in 1956, he had to go home. And didn't come home. Never moved back to Memphis. Uh, he set his law practice up in Baton Rouge. Stayed in Baton Rouge. Uh, 1959, nobody in their right mind would have run for governor. That, would have got, that got really ugly. Uh, anyway, really ugly. But uh, in 1963, he did come back out of retirement. Oh, I forgot to mention that that's how Floyd Kennan got on the police jury. His son got sworn in as governor, and the vacancy came up like two weeks later, and he appointed his daddy to the police jury, which was fine. Everything I read, Floyd Kennan did a pretty good job as police jury, representing the people. Uh, Kennan, uh, I just said that. So if I read these things in advance, I might know what I was doing. In 63, he ran again for governor. That's the race that's going to be dominated by Chip Morrison and uh, John McKiffin. Won't you help me? Uh, but anyway, in Bob Kennan had a, a very unfortunate case of timing. Now, you know, we can talk about it now. Bob Kennan was an avid, strong segregationist. He wasn't Willie Raynack, but he was an average at strong segregationist. He was very upset, not only with Kennedy's integration policies, but some of the other things Kennedy had done as president. So he worked out his, one of his big campaign ads. This is, in those years, Louisiana elections, they're really hard to follow. The primary was in December of 63. The runoff was in January of 63. So building up to the primary, Bob Kennan put a huge chunk of his campaign budget into a full-page ad in every major newspaper in the state of Louisiana, and he booked it to run on a Saturday because everybody was going to be looking to preview the LSU football game, whatever else was going on. And he picked Saturday, November 23rd, 1963, to run his full-page ad saying everything awful he could think to say about John F. Kennedy, who unfortunately had an unfortunate accident in Dallas the day before. So on the front page of the paper where everything he's talking about, the assassination, what's going on, you turn over and here's a hit piece on John F. Kennedy. Uh, most people thought that uh, Bob Kennedy was going to run third. He dropped to fourth behind Gillis Long. But, uh, you know, McKithen and Morrison were in the runoff. And uh, obviously we know McKithen won, had his two terms as governor. Uh, he actually played with filing in 71. I remember because 71 is when my brain got warped into political stuff. Because my eighth grade Louisiana history teacher had us do a notebook. Uh, everybody was running for office. You've got to remember this is the time we still elected 17 statewide officials. You know, register of public lands, all this other garbage. So 
I still got that little book somewhere, and I just got eaten up with politics. I'd also just read the biography of Huey Long, so kind of got me at that point. But anyway, didn't run in 71. Stayed in Baton Rouge, died in 1988. I've had this explained to me before. Webb Sintel explained it to me. That's his Uncle Bob. Took me forever to figure out where he was buried. He's buried in the Young Family Cemetery in East Baton Rouge Parish. I'm not sure exactly what the family connection is. So he's not buried here. He's not in the cemetery. So I cheated on him. One more killing the son to talk about. Still with us. Married one of my classmates, in fact, high school classmates. But anyway, Ed Kennedy. Born in 1938 in Mendham. Graduated from Mendham High School in 1956. Some folks in here probably went to school with him. I've been told he already was operating businesses when he was in high school. You know, he pretty much was already being big into business. Went to seminary for a little bit, uh, but well, we got treats here too. We got went into partnership <coughs> with the uh, Frank Treat and Concrete Business, and uh, pretty much set out to make him money. Did a real good job of that too. Um, Ed started playing in politics in 1963. Didn't work on his uncle's campaign. Worked on Chuck Morrison's campaign. And then 1971, he decided he needed to run on his own. He ran for lieutenant governor. Really strong race for a 33-year-old man, for lieutenant governor's race. Came in behind Teddy Acock and Jimmy Fitzmorris. Jimmy Fitzmorris eventually won the election. But he was pretty much tagged right at that point of this may be a future governor. In fact, I've got a cousin of his, wants me right now to get the article done next week about Ed and Ed's career. I'm working on it, but it takes me a little while. I'm slow. Uh, 1972, if you want to be governor in Louisiana, you run for public service commission. That's how it works. Uh, got that down in the next paragraph. Uh, Huey Long, Jimmy Davis, John McKithen, Kathleen Blanco, uh, all public service commissioners stepped up to be governor. Uh, he didn't just pick anybody to run against. He picked John Hunt of Ruston. John Hunt's mama's name was Lucille. Lucille Long Hunt, as a Huey and Earl sister. And he beat in a district that covered pretty much most of northwest Louisiana. Obviously, if Ruston's in the district, he beat Hunt. Took his seat on public service commission. Those were six year terms. So he served as public service commissioner from 72 to 84. He uh, retired and the little TV guy from Shreveport named Don Owen took over the seat. But anyway, uh, 1995, he put out feelers to run for the governor that year. Uh, you know, that was a weird year. I fairly closely watched Louisiana politics, and I didn't have a clue who Mike Foster was, really. And he ended up winning. So it was an interesting year. Ed did run, and as I said, Ed uh, still active businessman in Shreveport today. And uh, I don't much have to say about that, I guess. Now, we'll move on to number two, and number two and three are not as involved, quite as involved in detail as the Kenan family was. But you had too many folks in there. Okay. Mentioned him earlier tonight a little bit. Alfred Goodman, born in 1830 in London, died in 1905 here in Minden. Uh, very interesting story. Um, 1849, Susanna Goodwill, his mama, died, and his father, John, and Alfred set out to come to the New World. Now, had a really great opportunity about 30. 35 years ago, that's scary. Anyway, I presented a paper that I'm meeting in Shreveport, and this older gentleman came up to me, and it was Robert Roberts, and we'll talk about him in a minute here. It was the grandson of Alfred Goodwill, grandson in law of Alfred Goodwill, excuse me. And uh, he said, Would you like to see some copies of this? And he sent me three or four copies out of the journal that Alfred Goodwill kept on the voyage across the ocean. And it was interesting to see what he'd written. The amazing thing to me was he was just an amazing artist. He had pencil sketches all over that paper. Anyway, 
They arrived in Louisiana and New Orleans. We're going to Texas. 1849, Texas has just been a state. You know, Mexican War is over. Everybody's going to Texas. They're coming up the river. And when they get down there in the stomping grounds that killed Count Leon of Germantown, that killed a lot of the folks in my family that lived down in that neck of the woods, John Goodwill got swamp fever, yellow fever, malaria, whatever you want to call it, whatever variation, and he died. And Alfred was left 19 years old in a new country, came on up the river, got as far as Shreveport, got a job in Shreveport. And in Shreveport he heard, well, you need to go over there to Mendham. They got a whole bunch of British folks living over there. And they'll take you in like family problem. So he did. Came over here. Uh, the colony of Menden, I call it that, of British settlers, founded by John Chaff, his brother Christopher Chaff. Uh, Dad's not here with us anymore, but Dad would be glad I brought that up. But anyway, the Chaff family went to work for John Chaff in John Chaff's cotton business. I think he apparently worked as a bookkeeper. I probably definitely was a bookkeeper from the stories I've heard about how he kept his books. Anyway, uh, worked for John Chaff for about five years. Still had that money he and his daddy were going to use to buy land in Texas. So he bought a little bit of land in Webster Parish. I'm being very sarcastic there. One of the things we got back when we were in the Creighton Hardware Building, we found in the basement down there was some old tax assessor's books. And Alfred Goodwin. Next page. Alfred Goodwin, Alfred Goodwin, Alfred Goodwin. Next page. Alfred Goodwin. He became far and away the biggest landowner in Webster Parish after it was settled. That's where we got Goodwin Road out there. That was all his, his cotton land. But anyway, uh, he that just said that on there anyway. During the Civil War, like a lot of our local folks, he did sign up, uh, but he stayed in Shreveport as kind of an executive with the Trans-Mississippi Department. And, but he did take a title, act from this far, from the war on forward, all he was known as was Captain Goodwin, everywhere you see the name. So his business was prospering, he was growing <coughs> and being well known. 1853, he did become a naturalized citizen. He's really the first person who ever looked at that paperwork. It was a very different process. We were still in Clayton Parish, he went up to Homer. He made a wonderful speech that he'd written and renounced any, any loyalty to Victoria and swore loyalty to the United States of America, sworn as a citizen. Uh, he did serve a little bit as a town clerk. He was the first head of the fire department, so, but he really wasn't in politics per se. So I lied, no I didn't. We're gonna to get to the politics part of him. Just a minute here. Uh, helped found St. John's Episcopal Church. Another great story. This is the old church that used to sit by the old jail, and a lot of y'all are old enough to know. I've said something like that to my college classes. Old jail, old Episcopal church, old what are you talking about? What, what is any of that? But anyway, underneath the parking lot by the Civic Center. Let's just leave, you know, leave it that way. So anyway, I do want to run this story in pretty quickly. The Episcopal church got built about 1872 or 1873, and it was the... I don't know, I'm use the term, I'll use the wrong term. He was what we call the head deacon of the Baptist church, anyway. But uh, he was in the thing, and suddenly, about 10 years after they built the church, his wife headed the committee that redesigned things, and they put big, square, colored windows in the church. And I'm not going to attribute the family to him. I don't know that he used it. But he said, I ain't stepping foot in that building ever again to those, whatever windows are gone. <laughs> Didn't even let his daughter get married to church, better get married home. So anyway, but he did help found it. And uh, 1880, in the area between, uh, oh goodness, I'm gonna use a term nobody really knows. The Gladney building and where City Drug used to be, and that's gone now too, Lord help us. But anyway, he built a store building. They covered that whole area. Was the Walmart today, except they sold caskets and dipped humans. Um, was the largest store building in the state of Louisiana when it was built. Kept that title for about, well, about the time he died. After he died, they busted it up in the little storefronts. 
But uh, anyway, so uh, that was a pretty important achievement. And he ended up right that store and led them in the community until he died in 1905. Now, we're going to finally get to politics. Yay. His impact comes to his descendants. His grandson, yeah, his grandson, Jasper Goodwill, uh, finished the term out for the mayor. Uh-oh, mayor. When the mayor had to go down on the Penal Farm Road for a little while. And uh, Jasper Goodwill finished out that term as mayor. And uh, that's the first political connection. Now, Alfred Goodwill had a daughter, Olive Goodwill. I wish these folks wouldn't recycle the same first names, but they do anyway. Olive Goodwill married Robert Roberts. Uh, man, I mentioned me. And now I really sound old when you see these dates and I say that. But anyway, uh, Robert Roberts served as mayor of Minden. Well, I lied. No, I just got confused. Senior moment. I was the daddy of the man that I met. Never mind. I would be old if I did that. Robert Roberts, mayor of Minden. They moved to Shreveport. He became district judge in Shreveport. Uh, the couple had a daughter. Let's not get the names too confusing. Olive. Olive Roberts. Olive Roberts. Um, she had a political family. She married the son of her P.J. Foster, governor of Louisiana. Owns a huge chunk of Franklin Parish. So a lot, of, a lot of good land coming down through this line. In 1930, Olive, and I'm not sure what they call this Mr. Foster by name, so I'll try that. And her husband had a baby boy. RPJ Mike Foster, that would serve two terms as governor of Louisiana. So that's the political tie here. Pretty significant. Uh, I told the story on Facebook this week. Uh, one of the most awkward situations I ever had is I've talked with y'all about and I love talking history with people. And there are also people that like to hang out in the cemetery. Shelly. Anyway. And so I got a call. 1995, right after he got elected governor, Mike Foster came to Mendham and wanted to find his grandmother's grave. He come to stay with her in Mendham when he was a little kid and all this other stuff. And we went, he went to the cemetery, I wasn't with him that time, and they couldn't find the grave. Because a lot of the graves in the cemetery sunk. And in between time, between 1995 and 2003, to be good boy, Another descendant, remember going to the funeral. And he went out there with a rod, found it, uncovered it. So, 2003, one morning, about 6 15, I get a phone call. This is so and so, so and so with the state police, uh, which is not a good thing to hear. I <laughs> uh, said, uh, <coughs> Governor Foster is out, wasn't Ken Mendon at that point, but out at the old ammunition plant reservation. He's coming into Mendham. He doesn't want anybody to know, but he wants you to be in the cemetery and help him find his grandmother's grave. So I get dressed and look as presentable as it possible for me to meet the governor. And I head out to the cemetery. And as I get out of my car in the cemetery, one of those weird cemetery people is out there. And he comes up and he wants to talk. He wants to talk. He wants to talk. And I'm going, okay. The governor's coming and they told me not to let anybody know that he's going to be at the cemetery. And I'm going to be sitting here chatting with this man. And thank goodness, I don't think he was gone more than three or four minutes when the, the little black suburban comes up by Avenue and comes in the back way of the cemetery. So anyway, that's a you know, pretty significant political tie. That's two governors that we got their grandfathers planted out that way to do interred. <coughs> Bringing us to the third man, who he is political. And uh, part of this story I'd just like to tell, so I'll make y'all sit through and apologize. John Lyman Lewis, born 1807, somewhere in Georgia. Uh, his family tree didn't pan out too well, as you're going to hear later tonight, so uh, nobody seemed to care to dig that up on the published family tree. Now, in May 1871, <coughs> Uh, he married a lady named Martha Caroline Smith in Georgia, moved to Muskogee County. And you might hear it tonight, 
hear that I say that right. I've got chewed out twice on the telephone over the years for counties in Georgia. I said Muskogee. Oh, the little genealogy fellow I was talking to threw a piece of it. The other one was I said Houston County. Oh, it's Houston County. No, say it the wrong way. Look, we care about that too, I understand. But anyway, it's Columbus, Georgia, basically. He uh, served as an alderman and as mayor of Columbus in 1841 or so. He got himself elected as Solicitor General, DA of Muskegee County, and uh, set out to do his job. In 1842, there was a real problem in Columbus. A gang of about four guys robbed the bank. And they had them incarcerated in the county jail. And I'm not quite sure if it deals with calling the Solicitor General, that's just a fancy word for DA. He had supervision over the jail. And one night, he ordered those four bank robbers, hadn't been tried yet, let them be released. Funny thing is, John Lewis left town that night too. It never went back to court, it was never proved, but uh, everybody's pretty clear that it was four bank robbers. John Lewis got a fifth of the tape, is what it looked like anyway. So he, he, he fled the town, kind of disappears. Well, it's really hard to trace somebody between sentences, you know. So by 1846, Mexican War, he's in Minden, goes to the Louisiana unit to fight the Mexican War. So he was a patriotic. But uh, anyway, it's on the side already. Go on, you don't have to read that it's in the full time. But uh, odd thing when he comes to Mendon, he never sets up a law practice. Buys a whole bunch of land. It's all Bob and his wife's name, not in his name. Now, I'm not sure what the community property laws were in Louisiana at that point. But it looks pretty clear that if somebody comes back on him for the back money, my, my property, I don't own anything. That's all my wife's property. That's what it looks like. I don't know anyway. He, uh, it had to eat him up, but he really didn't get involved in politics too much. Uh, their house sat where Corlew, or old Ron Rock Pontiac building, roughly in that area. In about 1840, we're not exactly sure, 46, 47, 47, 48, they gave a piece of land out of their backyard and came to Menden Cemetery. Uh, but he played a little bit in politics. He was a delegate to the Democratic National Convention, 1856 and 1860. He was strongly opposed to secession. Uh, in 1860, when they had the big schism at the Democratic National Convention, he stayed. He didn't walk out with the Breckenridge folks. He stayed with the Douglas folks. Came back to Louisiana, and I think he kind of figured out the tenor of the time. He was elected as a delegate to the Secession Convention in 1864. Bought secession all the way through, but once the vote was taken, when they went to write the Louisiana Declaration of Secession, they put him on the committee. He was respected to be a, a kind of a Tempering influence, I guess you'd say, on the committee. So uh, the war started. He came back to Menden, took over command of the Menden Blues, who became Company G of the Eighth Louisiana Infantry, commanded them through the Battle of Manassas or Bull Run, depending on which side of the line you're from. First pass battle in summer of 61. Left on a leave of absence right after the battle. Came back to Louisiana to run for the Confederate Congress. And he ran, and when the election returns came in, uh, we're back to Louisiana election returns again, he won, seat the Confederate Congress. He and his daughter set out for Richmond to find a house, to find a place to live, and about two weeks later, he got a telegram, oops, we're sorry, Henry Marshall in DeSoto Parish won. Need to come home. Go back to the army. You're not Congress. It seems like this sour on um, the Confederacy a little bit. Foreshadowing something's going to come later. He did go back to the Confederate Army, came back home to Mendham, 
became the recruiting director for Northwest Louisiana with the Confederate, Confederate Army Trans-Mississippi Department. Uh, got active in politics now. I guess he wasn't the United States government anymore. He thought he was safe. I'm not sure. He served a couple terms as mayor. These were one-year terms during the war. Uh, still actively seeking support the Confederacy. General Paul Nat, that came here after the Battle of Mansfield and commanded the troops out of Fort Camp Magruder, had several meals wrote in his journal at John Lewis's house. So he was pretty good. Pretty good Mr. Confederate. And everything was fine. Well, I got way ahead of myself. Excuse me. I don't know. I soured on the college already off the side. Of course, I can see it back there anyway, so that's okay. Uh, within a month, well, a month and a half of the surrender at Appomattox, John Lewis turned himself into a scalawag. For those of you all that didn't get taught well when you were a kid, there were three groups of people in the Republican Party in Louisiana who was formed in 1866. There were freed slaves, there were carpetbaggers, and you all, all know boo hits about them, and there were scalawags who were Confederates that flipped over to the other side. John Lewis joined the Republican Party. Uh, he pretty much, because of his political experience, became the most important politician at that point in Claiborne Parish. Governor Warmoth, speaking of carpet baggers, in 1868, appointed him judge of Claiborne Parish. So, uh, pretty important job. He liked that power, and everything was going fine. And if I call you the wrong name, I won't judge. He's meddling newspaper people started getting involved. Uh, be the crookedness that came out. Uh, there was a firebrand, 26-year-old former Confederate soldier that actually served under Lewis named Clarence Pratt from a pretty distinguished Webster's Parish family. His brother is going to be two terms of sheriff later. But anyway, Clarence Pratt is publishing a local pro-Confederate paper called the Public Center. And he gets so fired up that he runs for the legislature. Gets himself elected to the legislature. Somehow or the other, he found out John Lewis's past. And he went to the floor of the Louisiana legislature and announced, not what you would think, because I already told you about the crooked part. <coughs> he announced, well, that scalawag John Lewis in my parish, you know, he used to be a district attorney in Georgia. He used to be mayor of town in Georgia. He held all those offices, and then he proceeded to berate him. And it seemed like that just was a little aside. We were operating under the Reconstruction Act of 1867, which said any person that had taken an oath of office, any oath of office, to a government under the United States government prior to the Civil War, and then fought with the Confederacy, was disqualified from ever holding office. Oops. Filed the paperwork, John Lewis got kicked out of office as judge. Had to just become a regular person of the Hoyt Malloy. Uh, well, see, I slide behind all the time. I apologize. I would read this thing instead of trying to talk it, but be better. You know, we're all going to sleep then. Okay. Lewis had two sons. I mentioned the daughter earlier. He had two sons. One of them that uh, was apparently a very solid, stable citizen. One of them that, don't worry, Suzanne, I'm not going to use the word. One of them that was bad, bleep crazy. Well, the younger one that was not exactly stable really didn't take well to what Clarence Pratt had done to his dad. 
So he challenged Clarence Pratt to a duel. And in the summer of 1869, they went down to Overton where the Pratt's had a lot of land. They fought a duel. Uh, we don't have any fantastical stories like one of them pulled his fire up and was going to be the gentleman. We don't know anything of that. All we know is Robert Lewis, Wayne, and Clarence Pratt went in pretty good. They had to, uh, he did let Clarence Pratt borrow his mattress to be carried back to Mendenhall. But anyway, uh, Clarence Pratt seemed to recover, looked like, but he went to visit in Texas four months later, five months later. At Christmas 1869, he died, 27 years old. Now, nobody, I've talked to family and descendants, and nobody knows exactly if it was a lady in the duel or just something else. But anyway, so uh, Robert Lewis has, you know, indirectly or directly got rid of uh, his daddy's enemy. Daddy still can't hold office because that's spelled out. You know, that's it for him. But I never believed this when I first found out about it. Uh, he managed to rehabilitate his reputation somewhat. Which, you know, your son's basically maybe killed a prominent family person, and you were scowling, I'm not sure how. Finally found some newspaper articles. Uh, 1871, Webster Parish was created. Uh, yay, us, uh, Menden got to be a parish seat. It was really strictly and completely uh, Republican gerrymander to split the black vote uh, in Claiborne Parish. But that's another story entirely. But kind of going against, you know, true. John Lewis worked really hard because we had two Democrats in the legislature from Menden at that point. You all saw the vote Saturday. You know what that meant even then up here. I'm sorry, it changed through history. But anyway, uh, it wasn't a good thing to be in those years in Louisiana with the government in power. So he really lobbied and got us to perish. And that kind of made it up for folks. They seemed to forgive him. When he died, that's what really blew me away. I mentioned Clarence Pratt being a firebrand. There was nobody like a firebrand than a man named J.M. Scanlon that published the Bossier Banner in Belgium, that thriving metropolis. And uh, Scanlon never gave up. Scanlon didn't die in the 1920s, and he still wanted to put his uniform back on and go fight. But Scanlon, in the obituary, said great things about John Lewis. said, we didn't agree with him, but he, he really was doing what he believed. So he kind of got rehabilitated in that way. Now, I ain't got no descendants to tell you much about politics with him, but I do have my story, that old joke about, I told you that story to tell you this one. Well story I want to get in, because it's so bizarre. Lewis died in 1871. Uh, his son, Will Lewis, started to turn the sheriff here. And through connections or whatever else, married a really rich lady from Red River Parish. Had a plantation down there. I used to know her name, but I'm old and senile now, so it didn't come back to me. And it was kind of, it was kind of peripheral. But anyway. Will Lewis moved down there. Martha Lewis and Goofy Bob Lewis, Robert Lewis, the one who had the duel, moved down there with her. And everything was really fine till about 1881. And Will Lewis, back again to Red River and Natchitoches Parish in swamp fever, got the fever and died. Uh, so he didn't have any kids. I've never found any kids to the daughter, and we'll cover Bob in just a minute, what happens to Bob. But, uh, so, no more political descendants. It dies with the will, so that blows my whole theory of my talk. When Will died, Bob, in his disturbed state, apparently, decided, well, his widow is supposed to marry me. Now, I know they did that in the Bible, so, but we're a little bit past that time now. And Bob goes up to propose to his former sister-in-law, and again, I'd like to put profanity in her mouth because I don't know she said that. She said very strongly, ain't no way. Sorry. Bob goes out, comes back with a pistol, shoots his sister-in-law, shoots her sister, and then turns the gun and kills himself. The two ladies did live. But anyway, uh, Martha, who I assume, one thing that never happened to John Lewis at all during this time, he never lost any of that money. 
It was still all around. She moved back to Georgia. Died in uh, Atlanta, 1884, I think it is. Yeah, that was only one life. That wasn't worth a slide. And uh, thankfully, that's two well-connected political figures. And I like the last story because you get a duel and you get a crime of passion. You know, it's a really, I guess you call it passion. I'm not sure. But anyway. And I appreciate y'all. Pretty much everybody stayed awake. That's amazing. <laughs> Thank you. And I can't do that for you big anymore. That's all, folks. <laughs>